class here, MIT 15 S50. Um, I'm really excited that there's this many people here. So I'm going to first, obviously, I have to go through the class logistics. I sent a couple of emails about this, so I think some people have been through this, so I'm going to do it fairly quickly, but feel free, feel free to ask me any questions. Um, so when, right now, there, right here. Um, Professor Schubert, I don't think he's here yet, but he told me he was at some point. And, yeah, so you got three H units. Okay, so this is the syllabus very broad. Um, I have no idea what people's levels are going to be, what people are going to be interested in, so this is very rough, but I tried to put up some fancy words up here so that it would sound exciting. Um, but yeah, I would try to cover most of these things that related to this. Um, so I'll um, keep that there. So okay, so card counting, not blackjack card counting, like very easy counting, how many cards help you with the poker hand card counting. Um, myths of poker, common misconceptions, and then so the next couple of things are all specific to poker, like pre-flop ranges, polarization, bet sizing, implied odds, reverse implied odds, analyzing flops, bluffing, um, thin value. So don't worry if you don't understand what some of these things mean. Um, folding good hands, slow play with river odds, ICM theory. And then at the end, there will be more stuff that's more related to just um, less specific to it, or more specific to um, game theory and just in general. So like decisions versus results, best responding, falls of natural behavior. And then some statistics and variance, risk management, and at the very end, some more like um, philosophical stuff about how to deal with bad thoughts and poker bots, because there's a poker bots class here at MIT, so um, I know some people will also be taking that, so I thought I'd talk about some stuff like that. Okay, so I think most of you know now, the grading is, is pass fail. Uh, so there, I set up a private home game league on poker stars, and there's going to be tournaments, and you acquire 10 points to pass. So 10 points is very easy to acquire, by the way. I don't mean for this to be a very high pressure situation where you, know, you need to, where it's very difficult to pass. No, it's supposed to be, I, I hope everyone passes. I think 10 points is very easy. Um, yeah, so there's no PSETs, no exams. Um, so it's just you need to do sufficiently well in tournaments. But the 10 points benchmark is very low. I'll talk, I'll talk more about it, but the 10 point benchmark is very low. Okay. So, the points is different than currency. So usually when you play poker, you wager some money or some points or whatever. And if you don't do well, then you lose your money, right? You your, money, your amount of money goes down if you don't do well. But the thing is with points, um, you can't go down. You basically, you join tournaments and you get points for doing well, and if you lose the first hand, you, you don't lose any points, it's just zero points. So, this is unrealistic, yes, and it's kind of unfortunate that people aren't punished for just playing a tournament and doing really poorly and you're not punished. But the thing is, the PokerStar software has a very good um, leaderboard system, like it's very good, it's very easy to see who has the most points, but for obvious reasons, it's not going to let you go see how much money everyone's made because that would be very bad, right? If other people can find out how much money you've made and look at your bank account and see how much money you have. That's really bad. So um, so it's a bit unrealistic that we're going to keep track of points instead of how much money everyone's up or down. But it's just, uh, I thought about this a lot, and I think in the end, the points is, it's just a lot, the advantages of points is a lot greater than the disadvantages because it's so convenient to see how you're doing and how everyone's doing, and you can like sort to see who earns the most points per game, who has the most points, etc. Et so, so yeah, so when you join a poker tournament, it's gonna tell you um, what places earn what amounts of money. But, but for the purposes of the class, in terms of passing and getting prizes, you're actually trying to get points. But if you just try to earn the most money every tournament, that's good enough for risking for getting the most number of points. Except you're incentivized to play as many tournaments as possible. So, so I think this is a good thing. I don't want people to, oh, you know, I don't want you to be afraid of failing. Like, oh, I'm getting my last dollar. I can't play anymore because if I lose it, I'll fail. I don't want people to have that mentality. So, um, 
you incentivize the play as much as possible, and you can still keep use your play money balance as an indicator to yourself of how well you're doing. Okay, so now the other thing is now that we know we're dealing with points, not currency, we're going to talk about tournaments versus cash games. So there's two essential ways to play no limit cash games, and these are the two main ways. They're, exact, they're essentially the same, but I'll quickly go through the differences. So for this class, we're going to deal with tournaments. And the main reasons are the reasons I, I bolded on the left. So tournaments are everyone, you pay a certain buy-in fee, and then you get a fixed amount of chips. And you keep playing until you lose all your chips. Okay? And the people who last the longest get paid money. For cash games, you start with any amount of money you want. You can bring any amount of money you want to the table. You can leave any time. You can start any time. So this table has a lot of stuff on it. But um, the main reason why I chose tournaments over cash games is because it's, for a lot of cash game strategy, comes down to you know when do you start, when do you stop, who do you try to play against, do you try to chase after the bad players so that you can win all their money, etc., etc. Um, there's too much strategy in cash game just involving choosing your table and stuff like that, and you don't really get to focus on playing the game. So much of cash games is just about trying to choose a good table, trying to chase after <coughs> bad players and win all the money and stuff like that. So for tournaments, you don't have to worry about any of this because you have no control over what table you're at. So it's just easier to focus on the game and focus on playing every hand as well as you can. Instead of thinking, oh, should I be quitting? Should I be leaving? Should I be joining another table? So, so in general, and also this one at the bottom, why the range of situations is important. Because in cash games, the, the, uh, the blinds are fixed, so every hand is basically the same. But in tournaments, you start out with a large number of big blinds. And at the end, you have not that many big blinds. So there's a wider range of mathematical situations that can arise that are interesting. Okay, so this is the daily tournament schedule. I might change this. I'm going to see how many people play these tournaments, see how it is. Um, so this happens every day, starting today and ending the day before the last class. Even on days when we don't have classes, even on weekends, this is the schedule. By no means are you supposed to play every single day. Um, <laughs> this is the set of tournaments you are allowed to play. This is when you can play. Um, so that's the schedule. I might change it depending on what happens. So, the thing is, the thing with tournaments is you don't know how long you're going to last. You don't know how long it's going to take, which is a bit of a problem, but, um, because basically you play until you lose all your chips. But basically, so it says, the major and deep stack tournaments take anywhere between a minute if you lose the first hand, and three hours. The other tournaments take up to two hours, so yeah. Um, it, oh yeah, okay, so I have a point here about the importance of multi-table. So, you, you'll notice that often the 7 o'clock tournament would have started and you're still playing the 6 o'clock tournament. So, at the beginning you might only want to focus on one table, but it's very efficient for you in terms of acquiring points to be able to play many tournaments at the same time. Because if you play four tournaments at once, you earn points at four times the rate. So, and I believe there's late registration for one hour for each tournament, but I'm not sure. I know there's, there might be some late registration. Okay, yeah, so this slide, okay, so take a deep breath, yeah, don't worry. So, I don't wish to fail anyone. Um, if you're far from 10 points in the last week, you should try to play as many tournaments as possible. And if you still don't get 10 points, you have to write a report to me explaining how you got unlucky. You know, I played all these tournaments and I just got pocket kings against pocket pieces every single hand. <laughs> I can never get any points. And I will probably pass you if I see that you try. Okay, so this is exciting. These are the prizes, and I've been fairly fortunate. I've received very good sponsorship for the poker world for this class. So keep playing even after you have 10 points. So I should have mentioned, on average, you'll earn about one point per tournament. So you need to play about 10 tournaments to get 10 points on average. But if you want prizes, for the top people in the class, there's some very good prizes. Um, so Mike McDonald is a world-class player. I went to high school with him. 
he was the one who taught me poker. Um, he's flying down during the last week. He's going to help me with lectures, and he's going to give private coaching to some of the top students. Um, so he's going to sit behind you, watch you play, and tell you what you're going to improve your game. So it's a very big prize. He normally charges a lot of money for Albert and has a lot of people taking this. Um, four other world-class players have also donated this. So the Card Runner subscriptions, it's an online website where you can watch videos of pros playing. So I'm one of the pros there, and I make videos for them. So there will be free Card Runner subscriptions for the top students. Also, Bill Chen, he's, um, he's a very famous poker, poker person. He also has a... Has, he started a training firm, I think. He started um, Suska and uh, SIG. So he's signing a copy of his poker book called The Mathematics of Poker. And so yeah, that'll be one of the prizes. Also, um, Andy Block of the MIT Blackjack team, he's gonna sign one of his DVDs on how to beat Blackjack and mail it to me, and I'm gonna also give it to So I'll, I'll, I'll announce exactly how prizes were played, but the, these are the prizes that we're So, yeah, so, okay. So I hope this is a good social experience for everyone. Um, you can click standings and poker stars whenever to see how you're doing. And so I hope no one is uncomfortable with their opponents being able to see how many points they have. Like, so, no, I, so like, there's no shame if you have zero points after playing four tournaments because, like, there's a lot of luck in the game, right? Sometimes you won't be lucky. So I hope no one's uncomfortable with people seeing how many points they have. But, so I hope, so yeah, so I, I hope this is a casually competitive <coughs> environment. We can, you can see standings and see how many points everyone has and see who's at the top. Um, but I, so I hope it's competitive, but I also hope it's, you know, people aren't like trying to kill you to win, to win like an hour of coaching with like McDonald's or something. Um, so, yeah, and I, so this is why I asked everyone to use your real name online so that you can meet people, right? I hope you come to class the next day and say, oh, your name was David M. Oh, who's David M. You made a sick bluff against me. And, you know, I hope you meet people in this class and talk to them about poker hands. And this is how you improve a poker. You talk to lots of people. Get their opinions on hands. OK, so the course homepage is there. Please join the mailing list. I think most of you know this. Um, so yeah, so I think this, this stuff, uh, I just emailed to everyone. Yeah, missing classes, cool. it shouldn't worry. Uh, it shouldn't be a big deal. But uh, each class does greatly build upon the previous classes. So, so like, hopefully you do. So um, Christian, my friend there, he's trying to, so yeah, so I'm very thankful for Christian. He's trying to videotape the classes, so hopefully this works out. Um, we would put it on YouTube, hopefully, but if not, you can try your best from the PowerPoint slides. So, yeah, so missing classes doesn't, it doesn't I'm not going to keep track, but, um, you know, you will fall behind in terms of knowledge. It'll be harder for you to get points because other people will know more about poker than you when you're playing against them. But, okay, so that's that. Um, okay, so, yeah, okay, so last thing, last administrative thing before we start. I encourage you to register. If you're not registered but do, plan on competing in the online league, please send me an email letting me know, like, I'm from Harvard or, I uh, yeah, yeah, so. Okay, um, yeah, this is just a slide on, I'm just saying, you should try to start playing right away. You shouldn't wait until the last week and play every single tournament on the last couple of days to try to get 10 points. It's, because if you don't play, it'll be hard to follow the lectures. Like, if you play a lot, then stuff that I say in lectures will make a lot more sense. If you don't play until the very last day, you're probably not going to understand what I'm talking about. So it's important to start playing right away, basically. And, yeah. Okay, so are there any questions about logistics before I start? So I was that clear. I, no, there was no, I was extremely clear. Okay, that's good to Okay, so let's start playing. So I'm just going to first do an example of. Okay, so everyone can see, so there's my Alright. Okay, so I'm just going to talk quickly about your example hand and then go through some theory. So, we're dealt ace jack of diamonds in first position, so we're going to raise, and 
This is probably one of the weakest hands I would raise because there's a lot of people behind me. You could have good hands, but I think ace jack, ace jack is suited. So ace jack with the same suit is still good enough to raise from here. So okay, so no. Um, so everyone folds to the big blind, right? So to the big blind, and the big blind calls. Okay, so everyone, does everyone understand the interfacing? People are with me in general. So this is just the poker stars interface. This is the exact same interface as the software I asked you to install. So hopefully everyone can follow what's going on. Um, just let me know if I'm going too fast. Right. So right. So we raised the money, and the big one called. Okay. So this is the bot, and and our opponent, uh, Cutie Pie. That's 90 into 195. So, okay, so what would people do here? So, who would, who would fold? Let me check. Put up your hand if you would. Put up your hand if you would call. Okay, so the rest of you guys would raise. Okay. Um, so, so, we're going to raise here. We're going to raise to 225. And um, our opponent calls. Okay, so the reason we raise is because we can put a lot of pressure on our, on our opponent just by raising here. Because, you know, he doesn't really, he can't really play that well. And not too many hands are really strong on this flop. So, you know, we're not really risking that much because we're only raising a very small amount. But we're putting a lot of pressure on our opponents because on a flop like this, it's possible that we have something like pocket aces that's very strong that we raised from first position. But our opponent probably doesn't have pocket aces, because if he did, he would raise, re-raise us a free flop. So in general, raising here is a pretty good play. And also, we have lots of ways to improve our hand, right? We have, we have, we can, we can hit an ace or hit a jack. Or, okay, so there's also, there's also lots of hands we can hit after two cards come. So if you notice, there's a diamond. So if two more diamonds come, then we have a flush. And also, if a queen and a king come, then we have a straight. Or if a nine and an eight come, then we have a straight. So this is called backdoor outs. So I'm gonna I'm gonna, gonna just quickly go through a lot of stuff, just to go through a hand, and then we'll talk about everything. Okay. So we're gonna raise here. So sort of as a bluff. And he calls. Okay. The turn is the jack of spades, which is pretty good for us. Um, and our opponent checks. Okay, so you know we, we raised and now we have we have top pair, right? So this this is good. So because now before we don't beat a ten, but now we can beat a ten or beat a seven or beat a deuce. So we have the highest pair possible with the highest card with the highest kicker, which is the ace, the highest card we go along with. So we're gonna bet four hundred and uh oh. Okay, our opponent raises to Okay, so now here. Okay, who would who would fold here? Put up your hand if you would fold. Okay. Um, put up your hand if you would call. Okay. Put up your hand if you would if you would raise against this. Okay, so what I chose to do was I chose to I chose to fold. And our opponent chose the best hand possible. With also the flush card. Okay, so this is the hand. Okay, so, now, so now, what have we learned from this hand? Okay, so what do we learn about this hand? One is most hands miss most flops. So on the flop, we raised because. Most, even though it looks like we don't have, we didn't hit that flop, right? We only had an ace and a jack, and no aces or jacks came. But the thing is, most hands miss most flops. So having ace high and jack high on that flop is still very good. So we raise. And two is, small bets and raises can put your opponent in a tough situation, and it doesn't cost you much, right? We only have to risk 225 in our bet, and we put our opponent in a very tough situation where he have to call us or get flown. So making lots of small bets to put your opponent in a tough situation is always a good idea.
And the last thing is, when the lines are small, don't put in all your chips with one pair. So there, when the jack of spades came, and I said, oh, let's fold. Um, I think you should definitely fold in that situation. So when the blinds are small, which they were, right? The blinds were pretty small. You never want to put in all your money with one pair. So these are just general rules. And I wanted to go through some general rules for post flop play because the focus of today is going to be on pre-flop play. I'm going to show you what hands you choose before the flop. And I'm not really going to talk much post flop. So, so for now, you just try to wing it if you're going to play tonight or something. Try to just wing it with these three tips and use your best judgment. Because I'm not really going to go through any more post-flop play after this. I'm just going to go through pre-flop play. And, and so I wanted to go through that hand to show a bit about post-flop play. But I want to go through pre-flop play first because you need to know which hands to choose pre-flop to understand decision-making post-flop. Because you need to have some idea of what is my opponent likely to have pre-flop before any post-flop logic makes sense. So, okay. okay, so the importance of blinds. So the blinds are the things that are the bets that the people have to automatically put in, right? So this makes sense. Okay. Um, so the game revolves around the blinds. The motivation of every hand should be to steal the money that was forced into the pot. Okay, so this is this should be the, this is like the fundamental thing that drives the game. The money that was blindly put in the pot, you're trying to steal the money that was blindly put in the pot. If there was no blinds, then there would be no game. Like you would fold pocket kings pre-flop if there were no blinds, because there's no point to, because you're not risking to win anything, right? Because there's nothing to win. So there must be something out there up for grabs for you to try to win. So. It's very important, and your mentality should be you steal the blinds as often as you can. Whenever you're playing poker, your men mentality should be to win the blinds. And also, I'm always going to talk about blinds. I'm always going to talk about how much money you have relative to the blinds. So, having four hundred dollars in front of you in a game when the blinds are one dollar, two dollar, for my purposes, is going to be completely equivalent to having $4,000 in front of you instead of in a $10, $20 game. Okay, so when the small line is, so when I make a dollar, two dollar, that's the small line and the big line, and the small line is half a big line. So in a game where the small line is $10 and the big line is $20, having $4,000 in front of you is equivalent to the other case. Okay, so I'm always going to talk about how much money you have in terms of lines, not in terms of dollars. So in both situations, I'm just going to say you have 200 bets without worrying about how much money it is. Okay. So, so you want the blinds. So that's the point. You want to you want to get the blinds. So to get the blinds, you need to not fold, right? You need to you need to raise. Okay. So if you, if no one has raised yet, don't call. So raise to give yourself a chance of winning the blinds for free. Free ball. So this is this rule will eventually have exceptions, but this, this is definitely the biggest mistake that people make at the beginning. They call too much without raising. If if no one has raised yet, you should always raise if you like your hand instead of call to give yourself the chance of winning the blinds for free. Because if you call, then the big one you can, just, you can see the pot for free and maybe hit hit something good. So okay, so now that I told you you want to raise. <coughs> We, we need to know how much to raise to, right? So let's say the small blind is $15 and the big blind is $30. So or do you raise to 90 or like 200 or like 500? What do you raise to? So the minimum raise is raising to two times the big blind, which is raising to 60. So however, this is usually too small. You give the blinds the odds we have a profitable call. And when they have a profitable move, that move is that money is coming from you. So if you only raise to two big blinds, right? So let's let's do a bit of math. So if you only raise to two big blinds, when it's folded to the big blind, they only have to call, they only have to put in one big blind. And they're winning, they're winning your two big blinds plus the one big blind they already put in, plus the half a big blind with the small blind. So essentially they're giving three, they're getting 3.5 in one. 
So, which is really good for them. So you don't want to raise too small, because if you raise too small, they have really profitable odds to call, and they're always going to call, and it's profitable for them, which means it's losing for you. So on the other hand, if you raise too big, if you just go all in free flop every single hand, then you're risking way more than necessary to make your steal. Because you're trying to steal the blinds, you, you don't want to risk all your money to just try to try to steal the blinds if you don't have a good hand. So you don't want to raise too small and you don't want to raise too big. You want to hit that sweet spot somewhere between a minimum raise of two big blinds and an all in. So this is just a theory of why you don't raise, why not to raise too big, why not to raise too small. So empirically, raising these three big blinds is standard. So if you remember in the hand, um, if you remember in the hand, we raised the three big ones, right? Three flop. Um, the big one is 30, and we raised the nine. Right? So empirically, this is a good number to raise to. But this number goes down, and this is very important. You, you don't always want to raise this much. This number goes down to two big bets as the number of bets you have to raise. So, so why, did, why is this true? So you always want to count how many bets you have to start with in the first place. And this is the most important factor. You should always know it. So the general rule is the fewer number of bets you have, the less you have to raise to, which means the smaller you need to raise. Because the number of bets that could potentially go into the full spot is less relative to how much it goes into the free So. Your direct odds are less since your post flop rules from the number is small. Okay, but the thing is, when you're counting how many big bets you have, you don't actually, you can't just limit your own stack size. Because if you're the big stack and everyone behind has a small stack, then you never need to actually play for your full stack. So it's not actually how many bets you have, it's how many effective number of bets you have. So we're going to go through an example of how many bets you have. Okay, so your David V1213, this player here, you see where the mouse is? So we have 400, we have 400 chips, and the big one is 40. So we have, we have 10 bets, right? 400 divided by 40 is 10 bets. Okay, so that, that one's easy. Okay, so now the next one, Lotus 64, we have approximately 8,000. So 8,000 divided by 40, that's 200, right? So, but do we actually have 200 big bets? So the answer is no. This is what I mean by you can't just look at how many bets you have. So, you, so Lotus 64 can't say I have 200 big bets. I mean, I guess that's, that's a correct statement, but when he's thinking about strategy, he's got to look behind, and he's got to notice no one behind has anywhere near as many chips as he does, right? He's got 8,000. The person behind with the most only has 3,700. So the most he'll ever have to play for is only 3780, right? So I guess I'm bad at division. I guess this should actually be like 94 and a half big bets or something. But he only needs to account for the big the maximum number of big bets he's risking, which is only nine. So when he's doing the math for how many bets he has, he only has nine. Okay. And this one's even trickier. So, so, and so, okay, so suppose these guys all have gold. So suppose Aussie Star, everyone in front of Anders BC folds. So how many big bets does Anders BC have? So if he calculates directly, 31, 35, that's approximately, I think, 78 big bets. But if you notice, behind him, only Sam7717 has more chips than Everyone else only has significantly less chips than him. So even though he's got 78 big bets and he could potentially be playing for all of that, the chances aren't that big because only one player behind him has has more than that. So like in this situation, he can take. So you would just make some kind of guess where um, you don't want to say 78, but if you're not playing against Sam 7717, then you essentially only have 30. So you would just go somewhere in between and say, oh, I have 40 big bets, or something like that. So when you're calculating your stack size, it's very important you look at how many chips everyone behind has. 
So this is what I was talking about earlier. So imagine you are Lahout, Lahout in this situation, right? So Anders BC raised to eighty dollars, and it's folded to you in the big blind. You have to call forty to win a total of eighty plus twenty plus forty, which is one forty. So you have three point five to one odds, and you're just basically always going to call because your odds are so good. You're just, you can just call so many hands and have it be profitable. But now, this is the exact same situation where Lahu only has 360 chips instead of 3,600. And now, even though he's got these great odds, he can't really call as much anymore because if he's calling, he's putting in like 10% of his remaining chips. You know, which is a big deal to him. He doesn't have as much room to maneuver post lock because post lock he's gonna be all in with a single bet. So he's gotta be a lot more selective about which hands he chooses to call in. So this is why when you have fewer bets, you can raise to a smaller amount pre flop because you're making because you have less room to maneuver post lock. So pre flop your cards matter a lot more. So just having odds isn't enough. So these are some rule of thumbs that go along with the general pattern I described earlier. If your effective big bet is greater than 50, raise to 3 times the big one. So in that example would be 9, raise to 9. If you've got somewhere between 25 and 50, raise to 2.5, so 75 points. If you've got somewhere between 15 and 25, just raise to 2x, so just 60 is enough. And if you've got less than 50, just go all in your full. Don't even consider raising with them and not raising wagering all your chips. So this is another important point. So once your number of big bets is so low, there's no point of just raising. You just want to, if you're going to play the hand, you should just wager all your money to be bought. And the reason is because once your number of big bets is so low, um, if, if you raise, you're putting in such a big portion of your of your chips that you're, if someone re-raises it, you're going to want to go all in anyway because you're already put in such a large portion of your chips, right? Like if you have 100 big lines and you raise and someone goes all in, you can fold because you only put in 3 out of your 100 big lines. But if you only have 10 big lines and you raise 3 of those big lines and someone goes all in after, you, your odds are going to be too good to call. So I didn't show you I didn't prove you the math exactly, but if you just think my work, when you have less than 15 big lines, you should just go all in the full, because the math will work out such that you'll never want to raise and then not be able for your full stack. So this is the beginner mistake number two. They're too afraid to go all in pre-flop when they have not that many bets. Anything less than 15 is fair game, you just go all in. And it feels like you're gambling, it feels like you know, it feels like this is just crazy, and it feels like you're gambling. It feels like this is not poker, but this isn't true at all. Even, even this has a lot of strategy in terms of which hands you choose to go all in. So, this is the beginner mistake number two. Um, one thing that I'll talk about more in future classes is you can raise to a smaller number of big bets from earlier position. By that, I mean, if you're really if you're one of the first players to act, you can raise to a smaller number of big bets. And the reason is because you're playing fewer hands, so you're more likely to have really good hands, like pocket aces, pocket kings, pocket queens. So even with 3.51 odds, your opponent can't call that much when every time you raise, you're going to have pocket aces, pocket kings, pocket queens. So I'll talk more about this later. Um, but yeah, for now, just follow these rules of thumb. These rules of thumb will be. Yeah. For that, for that rule of thumb, do you, says, do you only look at your money, right? Sorry? You only look at your money for that uh, rule of thumb, right? Oh, like, no, 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 sorry. This rule of thumb is for the effective stack size. So, um, when, I, when I'm saying you have 50, I'm saying you have 50 effective. So all these numbers are essentially, you need to take into account the other stacks as well. Yeah, and this would be different for that. Um, not really. It, it's the same for a cash game. But in a cash game, 
usually everyone will always have more than 50 big, big ones. So you would just always raise, you would just always raise them three times. Okay. Um, yeah, so these numbers are for effective staff size, which are usually close to how many big bets you have, but um, not exactly the same. Okay, so this was the picture I had. Um, okay, so we can go through, we can go through this, but okay, so, so let's go, okay, so let's, um, okay, so for David, V1213, for him, because he's a short staff, it's exactly how many, how many big ones he has, right? 400 divided by 40, <coughs> so he has 10 big blinds, and since everyone else behind him has more chips than him, it's still 10 big blinds, because he can, he can always gain before 10 big blinds. Basically, the effective stack size is the maximum number of big blinds you can gain more of. And for David V, 1, 2, 1, 3, this is, this is 10 big blinds. This is all of his money. But for someone like Lodo64, this is not all of his money, because everyone behind, everyone else behind him does not have anywhere near as many chips as he does. So that's why his effective stack size is not 8,100 divided by 40. It's only 3,780 divided by 40, because that's the maximum amount he can get. So what's important is the maximum amount you can gamble for. Not as a chip you have yet. No, but there's only players that are following the Right. So yeah, so if Lodo 64 has already folded, then someone like Anders BC does not have to worry about playing against Lodo 64 because he already folded. So it's only the players remaining who have folded. Yeah. Wait, so say in that case, say um, all the other players except Lodo 64 has just 400 dollars Okay. Then Lotus 64 has effectively 10 big points? Yes, correct. Yeah, but good. then why why would he always just raise 3 BB though? For Lotus? So why would he, she wouldn't raise 3 BB, 3 BB if everyone else only had 400 chips. Because because he would go through the chart and he would say, my effective number of big lines is only 10. So he would just go all the way. So this chart is for effect numbers. I'm, I'm sorry if it wasn't very clear. I should have said that. But this is for this is we, we always think about the effective number of BBs. Like you never really think about actually how many BBs you have because you know if if you're if you're playing only against one player and he only has five hundred dollars, it doesn't matter whether you have five million dollars or five billion dollars or a thousand dollars. They're all the same. So it's only the maximum amount you can play for. It doesn't really matter absolutely. So that's correct. So if someone in front of you has not folded, like they called, 
then you do have to rebuild it when you calculate effective stack size. Basically, when you calculate effective stack size, you have to you you have to take into consideration everyone who hasn't pulled again. Because once you pull, they're out of the hand. You never have they can't, there's no way they can come back in the hand. They're completely gone now. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, yes it does. But the thing is, um, so we talked about the sweet spot, right? So we said, right, so what you said is extreme is correct in, in that if you raise bigger, you have a higher chance of getting the blind. But the problem with raising to a larger amount is they can go all in for the 20 big ones, and then you're losing more when you fold, when you don't have a good chance. So you want to find a sweet spot where you're not risking too much, but you still have a good chance. And the sweet spot happens to go down when their number of bets goes down. Because they can't fall as much with good odds when their number of big bets goes down. Because you're going to move your group of spots. Okay, uh, yeah. I think this is going to play with people that are also very good, but you get bad at Right. So, I mean, yeah, but I mean, if they're calling, uh, that's fine, right? So if you're bad and you're calling when they only have 20 big bets, that's not a problem because that's bad for them because then they have no room to maneuver post spot. And if they're calling with bad cards with no room to maneuver post spot, you're still winning money either way. So it's a win-win situation for you to raise smaller when they only have 20 bets. Okay, uh, yeah. Could you repeat the questions? I can't really hear what people are asking. Oh, okay. Is, can no, we go to that here, maybe? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah. So, can everyone in the back hear me? Okay. So, we can, if you're asking a question, can you try to talk a bit about the rest of that? I'll try to repeat the questions. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So let's go on. Um, okay. Actually, so I think I'm gonna take a two-minute break. So, yeah, I'm gonna take a two-minute break. I'm gonna start again in two minutes. You can go to the bathroom, whatever. So I think this is like happening too fast. So.